Well, last time we left off with probability, talking about more of a frequentist type of approach to probabilities. We suggested that probability is really about counting relative frequencies of different types of events and taking the ratio of those events relative to the total number of outcomes. And um, we showed that that was pretty straightforward, but then we built on it and showed that we could get into um, marginal, conditional, and joint probabilities, and we could start working out some interesting problems. Now, we'll make a jump into more of a Bayesian approach, and we'll show that it follows on and builds from the simple um, axioms or concepts that we learned from the frequentist approach. And so, we already introduced the, prob the product rule, the product rule was a result of just manipulation of the calculation of a conditional probability. Recall the conditional probability, probability of A given B, was simply equal to the joint B and A intersection with A divided by the probability of B. So you can see by a simple manipulation of taking the probability of B out of the denominator and putting it on the other side, we get the product rule. Now it would make sense that if we think about this, that the probability of B and A, or intersection of B and A, is equal to the probability of A intersection with B, and the probability of A intersection with B can be written like this. So we take these two um, terms right here. We recognize that they're in fact equal to each other. There's no reason to suggest that if we reverse A and B here that they would have different probabilities. And so if they're equal to each other, we can take the right-hand sides and equate them to each other, and we get this relationship right here. The probability of A given B times the probability of B is equal to the probability of B given A times the probability of A. And this right here is Bayes' theorem. And so we can take Bayes' theorem, and we can apply an easy adjustment. Once again, all we're doing is taking the probability of B and putting it in the denominator here, just taking it to the other side, and we get this relationship right here, which is commonly recognized um, within Bayesian statistics. It's the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of B given A times probability of A divided by the probability of B. And so what's very powerful about this idea is the fact that we can take and solve for the probability of A given B by taking the probability of B given A with these other factors employed. And so this often comes in handy because often you'll find there's a conditional probability that we can calculate directly from the data and so forth. And there's one that's harder to calculate or we may not be able to calculate but directly, but it's more important to us. And so we can use this relationship to in fact flip the conditional probability. Now, if we want to speak like Bayesian statisticians, we would give each one of these terms labels. The probability of A, this marginal for A, is known as the prior. The probability of B given A is known as the likelihood. And the probability of A given B would be known as the posterior. Commonly, the, well, first of all, we should, oh, and the probability of B term here in the denominator is known as the evidence term. And so this is what's formally known as Bayes' Bayes' theorem, and it's employed all over the place for a lot of different problems. Let's make a couple of comments about it. First of all, we've got to be very careful that the prior should have no information from the likelihood and vice versa. They should each independently provide pieces of information. Often in many different practical problems, you'll see that in fact, the prior was used in order to aid with the assessment of the likelihood or vice versa, and as a result, it's a, there's like effectively a double dipping. We're fooling ourselves into thinking we have more information than we actually do. The other point is that the evidence term is usually just a standardization to ensure closure. That is that all the probabilities sum to one and so forth. So, common, so this right here is Bayes' theorem. It's commonly used within subsurface modeling. We'll show you examples of how we can use it. And it comes down to a fundamental idea of Bayesian updating or model updating. And what it is, is if we can reterm it, we can use different um, terms instead of A's and B's, and we can start saying, what's the probability of a model or a representation of the subsurface given some new data that's available to us? 
And so you could start with the probability of the model. This could be some type of prior before you receive the new data. An assessment of what you expect to be going on within the subsurface, the model. And this evidence term would be some type of probability of the new data. And the likelihood term would be the probability of the new data given the model. And so by taking these terms, we can get to an updating where we have now an assessment of what's going on in the model given the new data information. We've updated with the new data. So there's alternative forms of this Bayes theorem that are commonly going to be used, and I'll show you right away how they can be used. And well, the first one is the symmetry is the most simple and straightforward probability of A given B versus probability of B given A. And it's pretty straightforward. You can go through it, all the derivations and so forth. And it's just there's you're just reversing the individual variables. An alternative form is to calculate the evidence term as follows. And you might look at this in first glance and go, well, wow, I could use the probability of A, or I could use the probability of A given B times probability of B plus the probability of A given the complement of B, not B, times the probability of the complement of B. And you might look at that and think, that's silly, or that looks like a lot more work. But it turns out that in many problems, the evidence term is hard to get to. And if you look at it, this is actually quite logical. By the product rule, we know that the probability of A given B times probability B is simply equal to the probability of A and B. And we know that the probability of A given um, B complement times the probability of B complement is simply equal to the probability of A and B complement, or event B not happening. And if you take those two terms, it makes sense that if the probability of A and B happening plus the probability of A and B not happening is in fact equal to the probability of A. So that's quite logical. And what you'll find is that these individual terms are often available to you, whereas the direct probability of A, the evidence term, is often not available. So we substitute that in. And as a result, our new Bayes representation or equation is shown right here in this form right here. A little bit expanded, but you're going to find out right away that it's quite useful to work with that. Okay, so Bayesian statistics. Why do we even care about Bayesian statistics? Because so far it looks like we just did some manipulations of conditional probabilities, um, the product rule, and so forth. Well, it turns out that there's a whole class of problems that we can't just use frequentist approaches for. We can't just count away to them. I invite you, and I can provide a reference to this, the Silvi book on Bayesian statistics has a first chapter which explains this very well. They compare the idea of trying to calculate things like coin tosses and so forth versus problems such as what is the mass of Jupiter. Those, are, If you're trying to calculate the mass of Jupiter, you don't have multiple replicates available to you. You don't have multiple solar systems with Jupiters and you can build a distribution or calculate an average or something. So you'll have to use some type of initial prior information maybe there's some belief built into it maybe there's some indirect evidence and then you have to update with all available alternative for forms of information and so forth and so this is a class of problems which gets into the idea of updating and often gets into the idea of belief but there's another group of problems that i think are really useful and these right here are generalized as follows and these are the problems that really you could not solve these unless we were using Bayes relations. So let me, let's go through them. Event A and B. Event A, you have a disease. Okay, and I'm not being flippant about that, but that's a possible thing. And it's a good example to get in your head. You have a disease. Event B, you test positive for the disease. Can you see that those are two different things? You can in fact test positive for the disease, but it's a false positive. You, in fact, don't have the disease. Maybe it's a true positive, and you, in fact, do have the disease. Or you test negative for the disease, and it's true negative, and you don't have the disease. But maybe it's a false negative, and you, you go off thinking everything is fine, but, in fact, you still have the disease. And so these are two separate things. And, and could you also understand that if you find out you test positive for a disease, and the doctor tells you you test positive for a disease, you don't care about that as much as whether or not you actually have the disease. That's more important too. Well, let's get more geologic. Um, there's event A, there's fault compartmentalization, 
Event B could be, the geologist says, there's fault compartmentalization in your reservoir. And you see, you're once again more concerned about whether or not there's in fact compartmentalization, do you need to drill more wells, versus the geologist detecting it, once again a test that says that it's likely to be happening. Low permeability of a sample, that would be a problem because your reservoir is going to be lower permeability like we see in, in the lower tertiary in the Gulf of Mexico, very low permeability reservoirs, like 20 millidarcies and so forth versus a laboratory measurements indicates that the permeability is likely low. A valve would fail versus an x-ray test detects that there looks like there's a crack or some type of defect in the valve. You drill a dry well versus seismic, AVO, ampl amplitude velocity offset, indicates that there looks like there should not be good reservoir at that location. Well, once again, you're more interested in whether or not there in fact is no reservoir fluids that are um, economic in the location of the well. So all of these cases could be classified as following. Let's once again redefine our variables and then put phrases in. I think this is kind of helpful. Probability that something is happening given it looks like something is happening. That's what you want to know. That's what's important to you. Now you can actually calculate and often you're given the probability it looks like it's happening given something is happening. That's often reported as basically the accuracy of a test. How often can it detect it if it's actually happening? Times the probability is that something is happening. We often know that. We know kind of how often something happens. And what's the probability that it looks like it's happening? That's harder, and I'll show you when we get to it. Okay, so let's take an example right now. Um, we can go ahead. Well, so in general, no, let me summarize a bit more, and then I'll give you an example. Okay, so Bayesian approaches allow us to solve this type of problem right here. I've rephrased it, and now let's just give some thought to what each one of these terms are saying, the numerator versus the denominator. Well, in the numerator, this is in fact equal to the probability. Basically, it looks like something is happening, given something is happening times something is happening, is equal to the joint probability of something is happening, and it looks like it's happening. This is the correct detection rate. That's effectively what this is. This is the total number of correct detections. It's the total correct detection rate times the occurrence rate. That's the total number of times it's happening when you see it. Looks like it's happening would be a combination of all the times that it's happening and you see it, plus all of the false positives. The times that you, it looks like it's happening and in fact it's not happening. So if we expand those terms using the, um, using the method I showed before, we get to this would now be the total frequency of true positives, the total frequency of false positives, and so together they're all the times that you detect a positive. Okay, so let's go ahead and give ourselves an example so we can understand this better. Prior information as site suggests a channel feature exists at a given location with a probability of 60%. If you're drilling a reservoir and you have a channel feature, that's important because that could be a very massive volumetric um, opportunity for oil in place, or you might be concerned because channelization suggests that you have poorer sweep, you don't have as much oil available to you at that well location. So channels versus something that's non-channelized in the reservoir matters. So you have some type of prior information suggests at a given location with a probability of 60% that there's a channel there. We decide to further investigate this information using seismic data. So now, prior information, everything else you had tells you 60% chance there's a channel. So if it is present with a 90% probability, um, you'll detect that it's present if it really is present. So that's your rate of the probability B, seismic shows, B is seismic, shows the feature, given the feature is present. And so that's 90%. You're also told that if not present, with a 70% chance, um, I'm sorry, if not present, with a 50%, 70% chance, if it's really not present. So in other words, seismic will not show the feature, given it's not there, with a 70% chance. Okay, so now the question you can ask is, will seismic information be useful? 
So we have the probability of B given A, seismic shows the feature given the feature is present. What we really need to know is what's the probability of the feature is present given seismic shows the feature. That's what tells us whether or not seismic is valuable to us. So how would we solve that? Well, first of all, we can use closure to get at some of the missing probabilities. First, the missing conditional probability we'll need is we'll need the probability seismic shows the feature given the fact the feature is not present. And so that would be so that would be equal to 1 minus the probability of the seismic does not show the feature given the feature is not present. And so that's just going to be equal to 1 minus the 70% right here is equal to 30%. We need the probability that the feature is not present, that's not channelized, and that's equal to 1 minus the probability that it is, and that's equal to 40%. Once we've calculated these two, it's now just a case of plug and chuck. We have all of the probabilities, the conditionals and marginals we need to complete this equation. So we take them and we fill them in, and so what you'll notice is we've got this term right here, probability of the seismic shows the feature given the feature is present, that's the true positive rate repeat it down here as part of this equation and then here you've got the false positive rate which would be the probability of the um, that that the seismic does not show the feature given the fact that the oh probability the seismic does show the feature sorry given the fact the feature is not present times the probability the feature is not present present and that would be the false positive rate right here and so we multiply them out we find out about 82 percent so if we shoot the seismic and it indicates that the, the reservoir is channelized, that would in, there would be an 82% chance that it actually is channelized. The probability that the feature is present given the seismic shows the feature is 82%. And so that's, that shows us the seismic is very valuable. It's in fact going to limit our uncertainty quite a bit. So we'd likely want to shoot the seismic depending on the cost of the seismic versus the cost or how it would change our decisions, whether or not the channel, the reservoir is channelized or not. So let's take another example here. One in every thousand blow-up preventers has a serious crack in it. That's a problem. Blow-up preventers have to work. If they don't work, that's the last resort if we have a major issue with a well, especially deep water, that can be very dangerous. X-ray analysis has a 99% chance of detecting a crack correctly. If the blow-up preventer does not have a crack, there's a 2% chance that X-ray detects a crack. That's the false positive rate. The rate of blow-up preventer cracks is only one in a thousand, so it's 0.1%. A blow-up preventer has been x-rayed and the result is positive. It looks like it has a crack. Does it have a crack? We don't know. What's the chance a blow-up preventer actually does have a crack? And so what can we take here? Well, first of all, event A is blow-up preventer has a crack. Event B is blow-up preventer tests positive for the crack. And we have the complements. Okay, and so we want to solve for what's the probability that we have a crack, given the fact that we have a test to indicate that there's a crack. And so the probability of having a crack is just the overall rate of cracks, which is about one out of a thousand. And the um, probability that we test positive for a crack, given there's a crack, that's our true positive rate, is 99%. Sounds like a very good test. 99% of the time it'll see the crack if there's a crack. A false positive rate sounds pretty good. Only 2% of the time will you indicate a test that's positive for crack when there's not a crack present. So we use, once again, we can use our closure to calculate any missing conditional probabilities. So we do that. We're missing only the probability of um, not a crack. And that's easy. It's 1 out of 1,000. So 0.999 will be our probability of not a crack. And we go ahead and we can fill out all of our probabilities and look what happens. The probability that we have a blow-up preventer crack that we should be concerned about, given the test is positive, is only 4.7%. Can you imagine that? If that test is expensive, should we even use that test? If it says true, should we do anything about it? If it's only 4.7%, that's extremely, that's a very bad test. That's not telling us a lot of information. What is going on? Why do we have such a bad result? And it turns out it's a combination of two things. First of all, cracks are very unlikely. 
there's only a one in a thousand chance of a crack. The second thing is, we actually have a pretty high false positive rate. 2% of the time, when we don't have a crack, we think there's a crack. And so this term down here, the false positive rate, is bigger than this term right here, the true positive rate, and the result is it swamps it. That's my scientific term for it. It basically overwhelms it, and so now we have a very poor test, a test that's not really informing us. We could not have calculated that unless we were using Bayesian type of approach. So and then just to finish off with our discussion about Bayes' theorem today, let's just refer to the general form. And so what we've done here is we've denoted a problem for which we're calculating the probability of A, I, given B, as a function of using the regular Bayes equation for the specific case in which we have non-overlapping. So we're dealing with um, a situation in which the samples themselves are mutually exclusive or the events are mutually exclusive from each other. There's null sets of intersection between all of them with, the, with each other for any case for which we're not talking about the same event compared to itself. And they're exhaustive. When we take the union of all of these events, they equal omega. They cover the entire possible solution space. For that example, we can find that the calculation of B, the B term, the usual type of approach that we used before with the conditional probabilities of B given A, but in this case we have individual um, events, AIs, times the probability of AI, will then in that case simplify down to us. In fact, we can substitute and calculate it simply as the joints, the summation of all of the joints, the probability of B, and all of the specific events, and that will be constant for all of the conditional probability calculations. So it simplifies a little bit for us. We can very quickly solve for the top on the numerator term, and we can solve for all of these conditionals using a constant denominator at the bottom. Okay, so that was our discussion. That ends our discussion about Bayesian statistics. I hope what you can see is that, first of all, we were able to build up from the fundamental ideas of frequentist statistics using st really straightforward axioms that were um, illustrated nicely with Venn diagrams, if, if I say so myself, and um, get ourselves to Bayesian types of approaches. It was really a combination of just two product rules that got us started. Second thing is that Bayesian statistics allows us to solve for um, a, a more difficult conditional probability given a conditional probability that's available to us. It also is termed as the idea of taking a, like, a, li taking a prior, applying a likelihood that uses new information, not double dipping, you're using new information, and updating to get a posterior. And finally, I've suggested the idea that the Bayesian approaches are opened to the concept of belief. Now, I never got into showing that directly. I mentioned something about Jupiters and so forth. But what I hope you can see is that when we're assessing the prior, often that's a very subjective thing that may involve using experience and knowledge and so forth. And so that's what we term as the concept of using belief to get at it. And in, in addition, at times, the likelihood may also have those concepts of cooked into them, some ideas of belief and so forth. And so Bayesian approaches are open to that. Well, the frequentist approaches were a little bit more rigid. They were like, everything is based on the limit of having enough samples and relative frequency. All right, so that's it for basic statistics. Um, we will get into, oh, that was it for probability, I'm sorry. We will get into um, univariate distributions and so forth in the next lecture. Thank you.